continue with the Hyksos. So the little tribe from the south, Judah, became identified with the landless tribe, that of the Levites. Uh, these hereditary priests who claimed that their office had been bestowed on them by Jehovah on Mount Sinai were the true fathers of Judaism. They wandered among the tribes preaching that the war of one was the war for all. And Jehovah's war, their aim was power and they strove for a theocracy, a state in which God is the sovereign and the religion the Lord. And this is from Douglas Reed, The Controversy of Zion, a really great book as well to, um, to study and go into uh, the origins of, of Judaism, which is actually not Judaism. <laughs> So in the past, the historians Mametho, Josephus, and Strabo proclaimed that the wandering Israelite tribes to be intimately connected with the Pharaonic dynasties of Egypt. Again, nowadays, a few researchers carrying on the revisionist work of Carl Abrahams, Sigmund Freud, Emmanuel Velikovsky, Bel and uh, Commons Vermont help us to understand where the mysterious people of the Bible came from. Most importantly, we discover that the Israelites were certainly not impoverished, oppressed, uh, as slaves, as most of the world has been expertly conditioned to believe. The chiefs of the so-called Israelites had been pharaohs themselves and were related to and descended from the Hyksos pharaohs of the 13th dynasty, as we mentioned before. Their great capitals were Memphis and Avaris, Avaris. Um, Avaris was later renamed Pi Ramesses. All right, so that's another thing from the biblical context of Ramesses II being with Moses at that time. But had been known as uh, also Zaru and Zion. So this is where we get the, the Zion from. It was situated in Goshen of the Bible, uh, in the eastern zone of the Nile Delta. Suggestively, it was the city where Akhenaton had grown up and been educated. The Atenist uh, Kotari, who were expelled along with the Akhenaton, were, like the Pharaoh himself, members of this Hyksos dynasty of wealthy and powerful kings and priests. So, so, so the Zionists, um, the Jewish Zionists, that's, they're not related to no. that part of Zion at all? No. Judaism has got to be put aside because Judaism is um, a religion, just like any other religion they've created uh, for people to follow and convert into. Mm -hmm. When we talk about Zionism, we talk about the bloodline. Right. That's what we're talking about here. Yeah. Um, so during this era, there were storms and darkness for three days. Uh, due to a great ash fall, all right? In the Bible they say well, it was locusts and so on, but actually it was ash, uh, according to, to the Egyptian records. As a result, disasters and plagues, uh, plagues occurred in Egypt, which enabled the Hyksos to conquer. And that's how the Hyksos were able to conquer Egypt. It was just bad luck, it was nature. Um, some say it was some sort of uh, uh, volcano, a mass volcanic super volcano event that happened. Uh, some say it was Pompeii or, or... There is speculation, there is speculation with how far this ash from the super volcano happened and, and uh, covered most of northern, northern Africa. Um, there were many battles between the Hyksos and the Egyptians and it concluded with a final mass exodus from Egypt. One of their kings and leaders, the Hyksos leaders, was called Yaqub. And that's where we get Jacob in the Bible from. Okay, uh, there were more. They also wore, and we have uh, also statues and statuettes of them wearing earrings and curly sideburns. I'll leave it to your imagination. Who who, who does that today? So a bit of uh, framework here to to see uh, a map of the movements as well. So we have the Israelites here uh, from Jericho in this sort of region of Jerusalem and the, the travel down 
here, and this is where the native uh, dynasty of Egypt was at the time, where we get Giza and so on. Um, so, uh, we have this direct link between biblical history and myth, right? And real history. The only difference is that this happened around 1600 BC, and biblical history uh, from the time of Ramesses around, uh, well, I should have said, sorry, that should be saying 1300 BC, mm -hmm. right? And that's where we have the difference in the timeline. Uh, of course, there's speculation about it being a thousand years. I've heard that more recently as well. Don't know where that, that information has come from, but that, that needs to be confirmed. But according to, to the historical records that we have, it's around a 300 year difference. Uh, Pi Ramesses was a city of Ramesses II, and that's half of why there was this confusion of a 300 year difference. Okay, Pi Ramesses was built on top of Avaris. It's the same city, but 300 years later, it had a different name. And that's where we get the distortion in the timeline, because of the fact they built on top of Avaris. Akhenaton built on top of Avaris with Kia. Okay. Just to get a bit more reference here. Oh, it's another replication. So, a bit more of a... So Tanis, this is the sort of area or region we, we discussed of where the Hyksos were, were established and I believe their movement came from further east uh, into North Africa. Um, and when we go into more of the history in, in part two in a later date and see how people may have taken, if that's possible in another time, maybe on the you know, uh, later on in the autumn or something. Do another talk, but uh, we can go into the Brotherhood of the Snake and Sumer and where these Hyksos actually stem from. And, the, and uh, this goes way back. This goes way back. We're going back 6000 BC, probably around 8000 BC during the Sumerian era. Uh, so, yeah, you have Avarice here, so you can get context of where the area was, where they built Avarice. Yeah, uh, some also speculated that it was um, Kantir. And, uh, I mean, it's in the same area where, they, where this uh, region was that Akhenaten built his Garden of Eden, right? And the Hyksos established themselves in Egypt. So, into occult history of secret societies and Judeo-Christian religions. So, during the conflict between the Egyptians and the Hyksos, the Egyptians worshipped the bull, and the Hyksos referred to themselves as shepherds or the shepherd kings. You'll find this as well in the Bible, as well. They should be referred to, uh, refer to the shepherds or being shepherds. And we uh, read into uh, Joseph's story, especially Joseph's story. This significance was only an astrological one. All right. So this is what we have to start to uh, configure our minds when we read history. There is so much astrological symbology behind the words in the Bible. It's actually an, almost an instructional manual. And what's so great about that uh, is that it serves as a great, a great calendar. And we see these in the, in the references of, of these astrological animals. So after the Exodus, the Hyksos come back into Egypt in Genesis. Uh, chapter 46, verse 33 to 34, Joseph says to his brothers, When Pharaoh calls you in and asks, What is your occupation? You should answer, Your servants have tended cattle from our boyhood on, just as our fathers did. Then you will be allowed to settle in the region of Goshen. For all shepherds are detestable to the Egyptians. So, why is the question? Why would shepherds be detestable to Egyptians? It makes no sense. You know, you're, you're only tending... Why is something agricultural uh, to be detested in, in Egypt? It just doesn't make sense at all. And this is why the interpretation is, is that it's an astrological one and not an agricultural one. Right? The Hyksos returned... After the Hyksos, uh, the Hyksos returned to Jerusalem... And some alternative historians speculate Greece or Crete after their exile. So Atom 
was the god or Eton, as well as referred to Eton. I actually should have put Eton up there. Was the god of Akhenaton and the Hyksos. So according to Michael Tessarian, it was a rendition of the old Ra'am and Ra cult. He stated that the sun on the eastern horizon, okay, so now we're going into the astrological significance of this, was what he was now worshipping. He was worshipping the cult of light. Jordan Maxwell also goes into this extensively. Um, so I, I recommend also Jordan Maxwell. So the video here that we're recording will be available so you can have, you know, you don't need to take too much notes. You'll be able to refer to the video as well. Yeah. So uh, the light from the sun, as we all know, is very important. It has, uh, you know, the physical uh, light itself is important to life, for plants to grow and so on. And also it has a very important metaphysical property for us, for our well-being, you know. We don't get enough sun, we suffer, right? We, we uh, you know, try to put somebody in the dark for 30 days and see how you feel. So it, it does affect your spirit, it does affect your internal being as well. Um, the ancient Egyptians understood they weren't worshipping a physical light, right? They aligned with a spiritual, uh, with a spiritual uh, phenomena. It has a physical property and a metaphysical property. This is what Luciferianism referred to. So, Michael Sartre goes on to say there's nothing negative or evil with the term Lucifer at all. all right? Again, these are just words. You have to remember these are just words that are used in terms. The Arminists insisted it was uh, in Taurus. So they insisted the constellation uh, during the horizon at that time in, in dawn was in Taurus. Hence the golden calf in biblical texts. Right? The worship of the golden calf or the golden ox, or if, if I remember correctly. But the Hyksos, the Etonists, and Akhenaten declared it was in Aries at that time. The term Lucifer meant the sun of the morning. Right? Some of you may know that already through your research. During, the time of civil war, uh, during this time of civil war, the Egyptians who worshipped the bull and the Hyksos referred to themselves as the shepherds. The shepherd refers to Aries, all right, the constellation of Aries. And that's what Akhenaton declared. The significance of these terms, like I said, is only astrological. Term meant the sun in the sign of Leo opened the Egyptian New Year. When the sun rose in the horizon in late Leo and into what we called Virgo. When the sun rose in the horizon, they said, Here, Lucifer, the sun is born. Christians misunderstand this term. So we have to frame our, ourselves as well when we do this research to, to not come from a Christian, a completely Christian uh, biblical context. Because when we look up the etymology of the word Lucifer, Luce, again in French, it means light. It just means light. That's all it means. But it's how it's used. So, uh, Mary Magdalene, according to the Gnostic scriptures, has been referred to as being Lucifer, meaning look, the light bearer. Jesus is also Lucifer because he is the, uh, the son uh, in Leo of the morning born of a virgin, Virgo. Right? This is why we get this symbology of virgin and the word virgin itself comes from the word Virgo. And, and you, can, you can do your own research on the etym etymology there. Uh, the horizon for the rising sun was called the bearer of the sun. Right? You can see the horizon holds the sun, right? symbolically speaking. You know? It is the bearer, the horizon. And that's what tells you the time of the epoch or the era or the procession. Later it was plagiarized as the birth of Jesus. And then it was replaced with the birth of John the Baptist, which was in the winter solstice. And that's why we get Christmas today. Um, when in fact it used to be in the height of summer, the summer solstice, and that's what was celebrated. And also the ancients in this land as well, the Druids and the, uh, the ancient Europeans, uh, used to celebrate the summer solstice as being the celebration of, of life. Um, uh, when in fact it used to be the height of summer, when, when the star of Sirius was rising in the sky with the Nile and rise together with its waters. All right? It's about abundance. It's about all the gifts that life on this planet gives. And that's why you get the hidden meanings for the associations of Jesus with the wine, the overflowing chalice, the fountain of youth, uh, and the Holy Grail. 
It's all to do with the water of life. Life is water. All of these represent uh, yeah, the beautiful flowing water of the River Nile at the time. So the story involves the Levites, as we said before, or the people that are now referred to as the Jews. All right. So the word Jew is not used today to who are the true Jews. Okay. The modern Jews, like we said, convert to religion. They're different. Uh, these people are not Jews and are referred to in the Bible as Jews. The top rabbis as well know this information. Right? I've spoken to a top rabbi myself and they know this. Uh, who were these original Jews? Right? It, this is what Michael Tassarin words it. Uh, who were these original Hebrew? All right? That's why we get the Hebrew language. And the original is Ra elites. Okay? Uh, so we have Isis and Ra, right? That, that kind of comes from that term. And the word elite as well, as well comes from that. Uh, these are actual Celtic terms, but we're going to put that aside for now according to Michael. So I'll go into that more later. Uh, these were people who invaded Egypt again. Uh, what this exposed about the Hyksos is that they were Israelite pharaohs of Egypt. Uh, so Abraham, Moses, Joseph, Jesus was a cover story. Okay? The real Jews themselves were pharaohs. They were not poor paupers. So the ones that were expelled from Egypt along with Akhenaton, now we're going to the exile the story, along with Akhenaton and his family were the lower classes. All right? The elites of the Hyksos dynasties were priests, viziers, pharaohs, and courtiers. They weren't exiled. All right? Some of these people remained. We have to Keep that in mind. What are viziers? Viziers are, are more kind of uh, like um, like mayors or, or uh, um, people that look after the other dominions within the, the kingdom of Egypt. So those were known as viziers. Um, so they're like uh, diplomats mm. or, or also rulers. Diplomats and rulers at the same time. Mm. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and yeah, uh, these... These people are now the ruling classes of today. All right, we get them in the royal dynasties today. Uh, these high priests were the ones who chose to be pharaoh. Okay, they, the Hyksos high priests chose Akhenaton to be pharaoh during those dynasties. Like Akhenaton, they were the Hyksos worshippers of the sun who ruled the solar cult in Heliopolis. The original Israelites weren't these poor rag people, ragged people who were guided through Canaan by Jehovah or Yahweh. Okay? No, in fact, they were a mighty pharaonic dynasty. Even though a mass of them were exiled during the 18th dynasty, the Hyksos elites were well established and infused into Egyptian culture by that time. So you've got to remember they were there for 150 years, about 150 years. That's a lot of time. That's a few generations uh, to, to integrate uh, into Egyptian culture, uh, or even though they weren't Egyptians themselves. And, um, and these courtiers, viziers, and priests married Hyksos women, and vice versa. All right? So we have to keep that in mind as well, and this is why they managed to infiltrate again after uh, the exile of Akhenaton. Uh, so here, the sun priests who worship the dark, false light uh, of the sun, uh, the Christians refer to this uh, as Luciferianism. They elected uh, Akhenaton as Pharaoh. In today's terms, he would be considered a psychopath, a, uh, a religious extremist, or a maniac. Uh, the term Goshan, referred to by the Bible and Torah, was the land of avarice. Or avarice. The other name for it was Zion. Uh, Yurilena as well goes into, into this in her book, Archetypes of Deception which uh, is referred to here. The Levites, the original Zionists, the Ibiru or Hibiru, wrongly labelled. Okay, they were wrongly labelled. They were actually the Aparu. Because there's a confusion into where the origins of these people were. And a lot of uh, mainstream uh, historians refer to the Hebrew, to the Hibiru and the Ibiru, when in fact they were the Aparu. And that's a story for another time. That's a whole other branch of history uh, to explore. Uh, but what Aparu meant was shepherds, foreigners, invaders. That's the actual root uh, meaning of the word. 
They lionized Akhenaton, closed down all the temples, mostly the Amun Ra, and created poverty and slavery. Sounds familiar? <laughs> so this was tolerated for several hundred years and until finally the people rose up with Pharaoh Horemheb. Here's a bit of a depiction of him. And uh, he threw Akhenaton and all his priests out of, of Egypt. So you can see some of the symbology here. This is in the Vatican. Um, so after, uh, after Akhenaton's expulsion, along with his priests, they couldn't work openly anymore. Okay, that's when it was completely taboo to be a Hyksos in Egypt. And thus the name Moses and his story was created as a result and planted in the East. And so that when the West got the Old Testament, they got a false version of history through that. And the Lion of Judah was Akhenaton. Uh, and the Lion symbology comes from ancient Egypt and this was stolen by the Atonic or Etonic cult. We, uh, where we see it in the West today. This cult could predate the flood and just as Atlantis and Lemuria, we don't know the origins from the pre-flood era of these people. All right, so they have ancient knowledge, they have also survivors but uh, there seems to be a split in the spiritual practices of the pre-flood era when we talk about Tartaria, Atlantis, and Lemuria. And uh, you can see all the symbology here, the solar symbology. You can see the, the, uh, the staff that uh, the, the Pope is carrying, very similar to the Freemasonic symbol here that they use. And we, also, we see that in the police as well. I don't know if you've seen the police hats. Mm. They have that symbol, that's six-sided. Uh, was it? No, it's eight-sided star. But uh, very interesting how they all have this similar symbology everywhere. When we start to, to look with our eyes a bit more. So, uh, the Israelites uh, were the Pharisees. They were also the, the Scythians, known as the Scythians. These were the Hyksos. You'll find it in the Arthurian legends. You'll find the symbolic references in uh, Shakespeare's work of King Lear and the Bible. They were an inverted story of what actually happened. All right? These stories are about one story, and that's the exile and expulsion of Akhenaton from Egypt. Uh, the Lion of Judah is the Sun King. So when we hear about the Lion of Judah, well, that means it, is, it means the Sun King, who inaugurated, it was inaugurated in Leo because that's when the sun rose in the first year of the Egyptian New Year. All pharaohs, when they're born, uh, were considered spiritually as uh, in the sign of Leo and referred to as the Lion King, right? That's why we get it in the Disney films and all this sort of stuff, the Lion King. It's all referring to this. And all, all pharaohs, all pharaohs were a, wore a Masonic apron. And uh, you're going to see the significance of this in this slide here. All right? So... Here in South America, uh, you get Tepoxtecatl. <laughs> Tepoxtecatl, the preserver. Now, if you, if you um, look at his uh, conical hat, you'll see that there's a skull and bones crossed <coughs> over. And when you, uh, when you kind of study the whole secret societies, you'll find the symbology of skull and bones in, I believe it's Harvard University. Is that correct? Is it Harvard? From what I remember. And you'll see the Masonic triangular apron that he's wearing at the bottom there. And he's also holding a hammer. Very Masonic. And this is a very uh, old statuette of, of, uh, in South America that the Mayans had. Uh, the apron is not a modern invention. In fact, it is the, ancient of all, it's the most ancient of all garments. Okay. Um, Yale. Yale, that's it. Well done. Yeah. So the Skull and Bone Society comes from the Yale, uh, Yale University in, in the state, in America. And um, yeah, in the third chapter of Genesis, these words are written. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Okay, this seems to be all over the place, the apron. Um, the Freemasonic Master Apron, you can see here. Symbolizes you can see that triangular down pointed uh, version. We have 
the pharaoh wearing a triangle apron here, as well as the depiction of another statuette from him. I, I can't remember exactly where, which area the statue's from, but you can see the symbology is one and the same, right? Although it's interesting that the apron is the other way around in this one. It's actually the other way around. Um, and when we talk about uh, the ancient ritual sacrifices that used to happen with animals and so on, the apron was there for that significance. That's why it's so important uh, as well to these ancient cultures. What it actually means is another thing altogether. So again, the lions in the west are statues and symbols. Okay, we can see this in the coat of arms, the royal coat of arms. Okay, we always get the lion there, Trafalgar Square. Anyone familiar with that picture in the top? Mm -hmm. On the middle? Yeah, it's, it's right by the River Thames, uh, Cleopatra's Needle. Mm -hmm. I believe that one is there as well as another lion that's along the river somewhere. But again, you get the England badge, right, for, for England when we play the international games. Right, very well known. We get the lion symbology everywhere. Uh, the patron, uh, St. Mark, is also represented by Mar, Mars, when you look up uh, the word, the name Mark. Um, it, it has references to Mars. Again, these things are not, net, it's depending on how you view them, all right? Planets and so on, all these symbologies, they can be used for good or they can be used for evil, right? And as we can see through these uh, secret societies, they do not have benevolent intentions for us. Um, Messiah, also the word Messiah meant the next king of the seed of David. Okay, when we look at it, uh, look up the, uh, the word Messiah. Well, Adam or Eton, the Hebrew, in Hebrew, like I explained before, the T turns into a D. And then you also get the word Adon. Anyone also familiar with Adonis and Adonis and um, all that sort of stuff in Greek mythology? Uh, and Adon is the real name of Yahweh and Jehovah. And in fact, the Israelite Jews praise Adonai or Adonai. Don't know how exactly it's spelt, but uh, it's taboo for the Jews to call uh, their God as Yahweh or Jehovah. Um, in Christ is also an Egyptian word referring to the Holy Anointed One. It's actually pronounced Christ is actually the right word. I think it's spelt K-R-Y-S-T. And uh, we see this in many words. And... Uh, yeah, which refers to the Holy Anointed One of the Sun King or the Sun Temple. So, who are the Davids? Who are these Egyptian symbols we find in the royal dynasties of the world? Right. So, Messiah or Messiah, Messiah, the Anointed One, uh, or Messiha, or Messiah. It depends on how you pronounce it in Hebrew as well. Um, the, well, it's pronounced Messiah in, in Arabic. The, the anointed one, next in line, the next king of the queen of the seed, uh, the next king or queen of the seed of David. The seed of David is the David or the dove. All right, we get the doves here. That's a that's a symbol up there of, of the Knights of Columbus, free, uh, secret society, another Freemasonic order, I believe. Um, the commanders. Uh, just like you see the doves at the top of the maces of the Queen of England and the Knights of Columbus. Columbus means dove. If you actually look up the word Columbus, it actually means dove. Who are the col columns or the columns? Um, and why are these secret society of rituals involved in the dove? And according to Michael Cesarium, it's because the doves are the Davids. Again, it's another family line, and this goes back to Zionism and Israelites. Um, this is again not a people, a certain, this is a certain bloodline. And that's why the Queen of England says during her coronation, I sit here, uh, I sit on here on the throne of David. Me and my clan sit here in place holding the throne for Jesus and the seed of David. Why would you say that? Okay, we're not referring to it in a biblical context. And also, if it's Christian, why, why is that the case? So, the British Israelite royal family connects to the tribe of Judah. Alright, that's where it comes from. They employ 
Uh, the six-pointed star, all right, we see the six-pointed star of David, which is older. Again, it's a very ancient symbol, the star of David. It's not even called the star of David. It's way more ancient. Uh, you can find these in, in Sumerian tablets as well, the symbology, way preceding, uh, way preceding uh, Judaism. Um, they employ the six-pointed star and the, that should say the red thread, not the reed thread, the red thread. Uh, and we see that in the beef eaters in the Tower of London. And uh, the, uh, the <laughs> yeah, and uh, the uh, the royals when they walk on a red carpet. All right. We also see it as well when we see celebrities walk the red carpet during the uh, awards and premieres. Have you noticed that as well? It's all part of the whole deity worship or idol worship. They symbolise this, um, but we don't see it unless you're 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 aware of this information. Uh, the Judaic symbol, symbolism is not Jewish again, and what, what she is saying appears to be Judaic terms. They are not. These are Freemasonic terms. It has nothing to do with the Torah. The Torah is a book just like the Bible. To live a moral life, how then are Jews allowing the slaughter of innocent Palestinians? So, yeah, to live a moral life. Yeah. And this is, uh, this is something that Michael Tassarin talks about. Uh, they're serving the evil forces of Atom, or Eton, or Adonai. Again, ignorance is a very powerful tool. It's a very powerful tool, and they've used religion for a long time to also, again, one of the most ancient forms of brainwashing, or mind control. So this is why it's so important to talk about this subject, because it helps us orient ourselves to where we are today with what we are witnessing, this traumatic event. Uh, and the citizens have been placed on the altar of sacrifice by people who are calling themselves Zionists. They have nothing to do with us, not at all. They are, they ra they, they are sacrificing uh, us with all the people along with the Arabs and the Gentiles fighting among themselves, <coughs> all because of a misunderstanding. Who were the Knights of the Temple of Zion? And when the Knights Templar went to the Temple of Solomon, again, when we talk about Solomon, we get the word Sol, which refers to solar, Om and On. Okay, we get that word in the English language as well, On. And we have Om, we get this in, in chants and mantras as well in the, in the Far East. These are the three names of the sun in the ancient world, again, meaning the old Egyptian cult of the sun, where the Templars went to be initiated by them and be brought under their service. So here you can see, right, the dove. Again, the dove above um, on the, on the uh, staff. And uh, this is what the uh, queen coronates herself with, well, gets coronated with. And this is actually, I believe it's in the, uh, the crown, part of the crown jewels in the Tower of London that you'll find there today. So, uh, just finally, just to add on top of this, because uh, I feel like we're at the end of the presentation, but I want to add a bit of this information on here as well. Um, so, uh, when we talked about earlier about the, um, uh, the Knights Templar, uh, when they went uh, to be initiated by the Order of the Knights of Zion, okay, um, uh, this, uh, this, because when the Knights Templars happened to be fighting in the Crusades, and during the Crusades, this is more of the history of the Crusades as well, by the way, so they, they fell in with the cult of Atom. That's basically what happened. That's what, what the whole group, the, the story of the nice Templars who went to the Temple of Solomon, Sol Om On. Again, it's not an actual, <laughs> some say it's a natural place, and there is a natural place, but they weren't there digging for treasure, right? They didn't go take out their spade, travel all that way to take out spades and, and dig under a temple and get their treasure. Um, but uh, these cult of Atom, we know they've been ruling for many years, and especially we, they retreated, we know, they retreated to Jerusalem. And also some speculate in, in Greece and, and also in Crete. 
uh, other historians do that too. So um, they say that too. And um, yeah, they've been behind the scenes since their exile, okay? Because that's when the secret societies started forming during that era. They were open before because they were a powerful military force. Uh, Alexander the Great was part of that force. All right, when we talk about Alexander the Great, okay, he wasn't, um, he was, he's definitely celebrated in the Hollywood films, but uh, <laughs> he's, uh, he's, not, uh, he's not on the good guy. Um, again, anybody that goes and conquers and pillages other, other lands and cultures, I don't think they're more really good people. Um, so, because they couldn't work openly after they left Egypt during the Crusades, they had to, um, they had to, uh, they had extreme, also they had extreme wealth, the Satanists, okay, they had extreme wealth, uh, in the East and the Far East as well as in the West by that time. But the Templars met with this cult and were co-opted and they were shown secrets and they were initiated. Now, Ralph Ellis also speculates about Mount Sinai and why Mount Sinai is mentioned so many times in the Bible, but why is there no mention of the pyramids? So, what he's speculating is that the actual, what they meant by the mount is the pyramid itself, and that's where the initiation of the secrets uh, uh, took place. Uh, so that's a speculation I find quite interesting as well, and bear in mind that's, that when you hear the mount in these biblical texts, it could actually mean they were initiated in the Great Pyramid of Giza. Um, so the Templars met with this cult and were co-opted, as I said, and they were shown secrets. When the Knights Templar say um, they were shown secrets under the Temple of Solomon, and their writings say, we found gold and great treasures, right, uh, under the Temple of Solomon. It's preposterous, according to the Margaret Cesare, it's preposterous to think that the Knights with spades digging under a temple for a few gold coins. You're looking for, you're, you're looking for the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, what does that mean? It's, it's clear that it's not some pirate's treasure. The people worshipping uh, the Christed one, the Christ, again, we go back to that. The soul kings from old, the Freemasonic motto, and in the courts is Perme Riges. Uh, Perme Riges Regnant. Is how it's pronounced. Through me, kings reign. That's what it means. Um, and through the true Yahwists, or the cult of Eton, uh, Akhenaton, again, was eventually slayed by Seti I, um, according to historians. And the Atonists hated the Druids of Egypt. And this is what uh, Michael Sassari refers to the Egyptians as they were Druids as well. Um, and all things Egyptian from the Druid culture. So there seems to be a, 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 whole, a whole global culture that existed before the Flood. And somehow after the Flood, some of the surviving Druids, you see even the Druids, according to um, another uh, a, a Druid that survived, you see even the Druid movement has been, um, has been infiltrated for a very long time. So when you hear about Druids and they're doing their ceremonies and so on, uh, there's actually old footage of the Queen being blessed by the Druids. So bear in mind that not all Druids are also, um, you know, good or benevolent. In fact, according to Ben McBrady, because the 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 Irish, uh, the Irish, uh, the last one of the last Druids of the uh, of the uh, order. Uh, of, of the uh, Druids, the secret order of the Druids, and they had to go on the ground because um, the, he, what he said in his interview, there's a great interview with Ben McGrady, uh, but again, it's up to you to see what you believe about what he says, because according to even these tribes, these native tribes that we find around the world, they have an oral tradition. We don't have writings anymore. Right, these um, the shamans and so on, it's all passed down from generation to generation orally. And um, according to the Druidic um, traditions of Ireland, um, and I believe here also, it was part of the whole thing. I mean, we're talking about Scotland, Wales, England and, and Ireland were part of the same culture once upon a time, thousands of years ago. Um, 
and the uh, the uh, this ancient order that that survived uh, passed down the oral tradition and uh, basically he says that um, even after the flood according to the oral tradition he was given even straight after the flood the the trauma that was caused to the survivors of the flood of that era, whether they were Atlanteans or Tatarians, we're still speculating that as well now, where, where that was exactly. And they were so traumatized, they lost some of their abilities. And according to him, they used to have telepathic abilities and uh, um, other, other sort of supernatural abilities. I'm not to believe people had more abilities than what they had now. What's that, sorry? I'm not to believe that people used to have more abilities than what they had now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, whether it be, um, you say, telepathic or what, I don't know. Yeah. Um, well, there's been CIA, uh, there's been CIA yeah, declassified yeah, yeah. documents. In German, in uh, Nazi German um, experiments on it, yeah. um, that, that prove it to be, um, and the occult as well, that, that prove it to be something. You know? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. 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 I mean, there, there's even, uh, I've, I've seen a video many years ago in the 70s, they did an experimentation with telekinesis, where people are sat and they you know, um, they're actually moving things with their minds. Yeah, I've seen that, yeah. Uh, I found that pretty the interesting. The woman who was very good at it, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So there's, 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 there's been this sort of examples of supernatural yeah. abilities that yeah. humans have. Also, I've travelled to China, I've done martial arts for many years, and I've witnessed firsthand, you know, healing through chi. I've broken my ankle, and, well, yeah. almost broke my ankle, I've completely sprained it. and. This chi master that I that I got to know used his hand, and I felt this this sort of heat coming from his hand, and it it really healed. But the next day I could I could run no problem, um, and that's really was the beginning of my questioning of reality, of what reality truly is. Uh, so there are things like this that are uh, hidden from the mainstream or or from suppressed. Yeah, I suppress this information. This yeah. sort of supernatural stuff. My, my mother-in-law is, is a shamanic healer and also teaches as a, as a, as a psychic academy, mm -hmm. but she said that a lot of people are born with the abilities, but because modern society, we are so they're born with, oh, they can't yeah. help it, yeah, yeah. or also because, yeah. you know, they're, they, yeah, mm -hmm. like the, the way we, she, mm -hmm. so she said that. Yeah. The way we conditioned, you know. Exactly. Yeah. 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 She yeah. said that many people, yeah. and also she did courses on people who yeah. do the shamanic uh, traveling, but she said, like many people, uh, in general, I would say, or and, uh, a lot of people have abilities, it's not yeah. but, yeah. but yeah. Uh, I'm not aware of them. Mm. Yeah. And that's why they get them young, that's why they get yeah. them young, yeah. because that's, that's where the cool. abilities yeah. start. With so that's where they flower, well, that's where they dampen them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's why they flower, and, and, and they suppress that, those abilities from a young age, because I remember my childhood, everything was magical. Uh, I was fortunate enough to grow up in, in, in Scandinavia, Norway, and everything was just, it was just magical. But uh, I remember when I used to play football, I remember one time I kicked the ball, and it hit the post, but it started spinning on there, and I, I had all these fantasies about doing these supernatural sort of kicks. And as a kid, I did it, and I actually did it, and I remember the kids at the time, it, it came, it started spinning on the post like for a good five, six seconds and then it went into the goal. And I was like, wow, I, I did that. And I was only like 12 or something. So, you know, it's amazing what, what, what abilities we have through our imagination and what we, we truly, if we can manifest, you know, our beliefs, uh, or should I say our gnosis, really, because that's another word uh, to, again, when we talk about believing and you're actually you'll be living a lie is what it means um, so knowing is more important than believing but unfortunately um, i also think that that, uh, uh, that's why yeah, i'm talking again about dutch culture people are very i would say skeptic skeptical about it because also there are people with abilities but they completely commercially exploit it yeah, yeah. or it's almost dangerous because they you know don't really control it or whatever mm -hmm. So yeah, so it's also one of the yeah, the, uh, the two yeah. drummers of the record breakers. There used to be an English program called the Record Breakers. Oh yeah, I remember that. And the two twin brothers used to work for the British intelligence during the war, and they had photographic memories. They just you couldn't read a book like that. If it, well, do you remember the two twin brothers? Speed reading. Yeah, yeah. and um, they, they both had 
Oh, amazing. amazing. The fact that I'm so contented, I could, uh, I could read a book by just looking through it. And, yeah. like that. and, and, then, and then they get asked questions by... Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. They can ask them. They read the book. Yeah. And then they ask questions about the book. You can imagine, yeah. they've they written a million books. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah, I mean, it's, it's all over. There's a great... Uh, it's really, I, I find it hard, you can find it if you search hard, hard enough. If you write Chi Master or CHI Master Sky 3 documentary, this was done back in the 90s, mm. and you'll witness firsthand, they actually got scientists to come and analyze this guy mm. who also had supernatural mm. abilities with Chi. And by the way, we mm. can all still learn this. Mm. Uh, it's just that we just don't have the time to practice. We're busy in the wheel, hamster wheel, not actually getting in touch with our bodies and nature, you know, this is what they don't want us to have time for, mm. is to, into, to work on our bodies, exactly, and yeah. the energy and our intelligence, yeah, and our consciousness, mm. yeah. expanding our yeah. consciousness and our knowledge, they don't want us to have time to sit down and read books yeah. and, and read history, yeah. you know, you've got to be like unemployed, but, <laughs> or if you're traveling, and that's why Michael Sorin, I have a, I'm a big fan of him, because he's a working class man from Belfast, and he started discovering all this stuff back in the sort of, I believe back in the, set, the sort of mid 70s and so on. And he began his journey of research. And he's been, you know, his body of work is huge. And, um, you know, if you really want to get into the depth, like you can go into um, unslave.com or michaeltesarian.com and find great work. He's got courses. You can choose any topic you want. You know, it's like the real university mm. of life, you know. It's truly really amazing the stuff that I think is going on now as well. Yeah. That's why I look like you quite knowledgeable when you try and talk to people. You sound like you could be kind of lunatic. You've got to yeah. be really careful how you approach things. But to, uh, to, to be, but, yeah. You know, it's just, it's, it's unbelievable. It's like a horror movie, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Oh, it is like a horror movie. It's just yeah. unbelievable. Oh, yeah. oh, it's like a lunatic asylum. Yeah. 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 Sometimes, yeah. Like, yeah. Someone said to me 15, 20 years ago, this was a case that I said to me, but the thing is, this is the thing about um, about uh, self empowerment. I'll be going into that in one of the later talks. I think it's the last talk about sovereignty, because I want to go through psychology as well, because we've really got to start um, working on ourselves and getting in touch with our spirituality, with the God, within. or within. Yeah, within. because. All, create, all the creator, the prime creator is within us. We don't need to look outside right. for, for, for that, uh, for that saviour. The saviour is within, and that's what they don't want you to know. Mm -hmm. 